Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome back, folks, again to the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. I was just holding up this piece of Tom, can you get this piece here right here? I want you, I want, you got to get a copy of this photo. This is, this is, Sun, this is Sunday Oregonian, and uh, it's the opinion area of the Sunday Oregonian. The paper has changed, by the way. Sometimes I don't even know how to read it. But, <laughs> but the bottom line is that uh, they've made an endorsement of the most popular person in the state of Oregon. I mean, there was Phil Knight, and then there was, uh, there was Monica Whitby. And she's, she happens to be running for the U.S. Senate here in the state of Oregon, she got the Republican, uh, she got the endorsement, if you will, of the Republicans who are running uh, in this particular race. And two, one, she'll probably be our next senator. I mean, that's just my opinion. I mean, <laughs> I'm reading it's the opinion. It's very smart. Uh, that very was small, smart opinion. Yeah, and that was small print here. On this <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Well, look, I, I had to start off with that because um, the Oregonian did sort of a uh, sort of a contest, if you will, just among Oregonians. Like I was, I was there, but I was down there at the on the bottom end of it aspect of it. Mm-hmm. But people like uh, Phil Knight, Steve Novak, and yourself, and I noticed that last piece. It was about Phil Knight, uh, mm-hmm. Novak, and you. And at the end of the day, it was Phil Knight and you. Wow, <laughs> that was funny, wasn't Isn't it? That something? Yeah, but uh, but the fact of the matter is, you know, you, you happen to be running uh, for the Senate, the U.S. Senate. You know, I you're a Republican, and 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 that whole contest and you know, that whole whatever. You know, there were Republicans in there. There were Democrats. Right. There were there were Libertarians. Uh, there were all kinds of people there. The fact of it is, you came out at the top of the deal. I mean, that's you need to be congratulated. It was really quite a, and, an honor. Oh, I really very much was so. And very, very to, surprised. We need we need to be enthusiastic at this exactly. point in time. We're having some tough times, you know, but in the country. But here in Oregon, we, it's, it was really a blessing to see the, the contest. You know, and an icon like Phil Knight. You know, and all of a sudden, here comes Monica. <laughs> Here comes Monica. I had my I had my money on you. you know. Did you? Oh, did you? No know. Well, yeah, we, had a, we, we had we had an excellent <laughs> grassroots effort there did you? too. We, oh, that was it was really wonderful. Oh, this, this was this was fantastic, Monica. And then again, at the same time, you get the endorsement. You get the endorsement of the Oregonian in that particular race. I mean, you got some pretty heavy rates up in there. Well, I'm I mean, very this is the excited. first time you're at the table. I mean, you you, you wasn't uh, you wasn't a, a local small race. Uh, whether you wasn't elected to this or this or that. I mean, they, they they're ser- seriously. Considering you our next senator. Well, I think that that's what's Im- what's important, Bruce. Yeah. Is that I think people realize now that we we need to change the way we're doing yeah. politics mm-hmm. as usual. I think people understand that the way things are going in Washington D.C. are just not working mm-hmm. right now, and we really need a different approach. And and as a as doctors, you know, we we have a different problem solver type approach, and that's the way we look at issues. Is you know, look at the different. Uh, the talk to the patient first and listen like like we were talking about earlier if you you've got to talk to people to find out what the problems right, are and if right. you don't listen you don't hear what right. the problems are that's why it's so important to get out into the communities like like we have been doing and going all around the state mm-hmm. to 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 talk to people and and really hear what their concerns are because until you know the concerns how are you going to exactly. solve the problem exactly. Exactly. and and that's our goal is to to take care of all of the state listen to people all over the state because it's different depending on which community you're in mm-hmm. well you know Mark, i got james here with me and yes. uh, and i'll, I'll do respect uh, uh, there's a, there was another person that was supposed to be with us delinda mm-hmm. she happened to be a uh, uh, Latino Mexican because right. really the whole issue of immigration is a major major issue of concern around the country and even here in the state of Oregon and she also supports you because she feels that you have you will give an ear if you will to this whole discussion of the immigration issue aspect of it and then I, I happen to be uh, myself I happen to be running for county commissioner in probably the one of the largest districts here in the state of Oregon for that matter and we got we got a number of poor people we got mental health issues we got job issue aspect of it we got education problems we are the melting pot aspect of it and then I've got James right here you know and and James is running against Earl Blumenauer and and Earl has always had a he's always had a pass you know here and then because it's, it is a quote democratic era uh, but the fact of the matter is is that Earl is not responding to the issues that we have here on the, the issues I just listed education the crime things of that nature and whatever and so uh, uh, you know we're excited about the fact that he's here and he's going to be he's going to be running to compete against Earl and hopefully Earl will come to the show and and debate with with James I have no problem with James debating with Earl Earl, Earl. I mean Earl has taken some very interesting positions as of late 
Uh, he's pushing the marijuana bill, you know, because they're having that problem up in Washington right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, his, his, his whole campaign is that the federal government should, should not be involved in, in this marijuana issue of approving. Well, hell, who in the hell is he? What does he do? I mean, that's what he's supposed to be doing. He is the federal government. <laughs> uh, he is our representative of the federal government. Now, what is going on, Earl? What's your problem? Well, the bottom line is that as far as I'm concerned, he's got to do something, and James is the answer. James, you are the answer, buddy. You get this thing squared away. Bring this guy down here. You know, and as a small business owner, actually, I've talked to some small businesses in the area, and I've asked them, I said, well, okay, what, what, how do we do with this business? And so we had some good discussion. And some of the things that, some of the things that really came out was that Bruce, this is the guy that owns a nursery business aspect of it, he does maintenance and whatever. He said, those guys, okay, fine. They started talking about the marijuana thing. And, you know, they was, they were smoking marijuana and whatever, and then coming to work. And all of a sudden, they weren't, as, they weren't working as efficiently as they would be mm -hmm. normally. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, there's two or three people having to work together. Right. So I'm paying for three people as opposed to one person. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's a, that's a question. So that's the thing. It's one of the things I want to put mm -hmm. on the table. You know, what are we going to do about that issue? Mm -hmm. So we got we got some more issues to talk about. I realize mm -hmm. that the young folks, uh, uh, some old folks too, mm -hmm. are dealing with the whole issue and smoking the joint and all this other good stuff and freedom and whatever. Okay, that's fine. But the fact of the is, what impact is this going to have? And I don't think we're in a position right now to really just make a decision just right off the bat. I think right we have bat. to be real careful about that. You know, as a as a pediatric neurosurgeon, right. I very concerned about the effects of marijuana on the brain. There was a study that just came out that mm. shows that it does cause changes in the brain mm -hmm. itself. And and that's one thing that we have to worry about. We don't really know what effect it's going to have on the de developing brain. And we certainly don't want to leave, you know, be irresponsible and leave our children with uh, deficits and problems um, that, that could possibly mm -hmm. show up further down the road. And another thing that really worries me about it is it's, it's difficult for our law enforcement to know when someone's intoxicated and when they're not. It's not like with alcohol where you can just do a breathalyzer test and I mean, how, you, you can't measure immediately straight away mm -hmm. whether or not what somebody's blood level is if they've been smoking marijuana. You can't say for sure. Mm -hmm. And so that puts our, our law enforcement at, 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 at risk because they can't say for sure straight away. And, and so that is a big concern that, that I have about good, it. Good. I don't know about James, you, come on, James. You, you're going to be representing well, the, to me, the it's people. A, it's a matter of principle. I mean, everybody okay. can agree that kids sh shouldn't smoke marijuana. Everybody mm -hmm. can agree we keep it out of the schools. Everybody can agree we prosecute people who do that. You know, personally, I think smoking dope is a waste of time. It makes people lazy. Might even turn them into Democrats, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but but it's a matter of principle. You know, are we sort of some sort of cows that are farmed by the government, and you can eat this, and you can't eat this, yeah. and you can take this, and you cannot take that? You know, you go back 100, 150 years when America was sort of strongest and the values were the strongest. You could go down to the drugstore and you could buy opium. Mm -hmm. You know, and sure, you had a lot of people who were addicted to that, but. Ultimately, what is going to control people is self-control and cultural controls and a strong society. And this whole motion to have the government replace society and try and control everything hasn't worked out very well for us. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, James, again, I still come back. Everybody makes the point about we're tired of government in involving our lives. Right. Well, who, who are these folks? Who's representing us in government? And that's what I'm saying. I really take a strong stand about the fact that if one gets elected, that's who they are. Mm -hmm. You're representing us, and you're the government aspect of it. And we're having problems. In fact, you, you ask the average American, they'll say, hey, look, where's term limits? Right. That's the first thing. Where is term limits? Who's representing us? These guys are all millionaires. I mean, I saw an Adam Earl today, if you will, <laughs> and there he was looking like a don, you know, open collar, no, no tie now, uh, you know, sitting in a million-dollar pad, if you will. You got my point? I mean, when is he going to start? And then he's also talking about, you know, doubling the price of, of, of taxes, if you will, on gas tax or whatever. Well, he didn't have to worry about it. First, he's riding a bicycle every day. And he's, constantly, <laughs> and he's got one on his lapel that has been But the fact of the matter is poor people can't afford new, new efficient cars. Right. So that should be on the table. What do you do? He should yeah. be thinking about that when he starts talking about raising the deal. Okay? Right? right? No, it, it's true. I mean, we have a lot of politicians who are just complete elitists. They never talk to ordinary people. And, and they go out and they generate all these problems for ordinary people, and they're completely blind to them. You know, we need a revolution that begins to take pruning shears and start chopping off all these branches of government that aren't really doing good for people and are just making things more complicated. 
you know, what big concern of the community is jobs. Why don't we have any jobs? Because if someone wants to start a business and create jobs, we have five or six or seven branches of government out there kicking them in the private parts, you know, just for daring to hire people. And you're going to change that government? Are you going to change government? Are you going to be doing that? What are you going to do? <laughs> Prune. Prune. Yeah, prune. Oh, prune. Yeah. Oh, boy. They, they're going to cut off some jobs. <laughs> anyway. anyway, Monica, what do you think? think? I think one of the problems that, that just exactly like James is saying is the, the career politician thing. I, if, if people get out there and they, you know, I don't think our founding fathers ever intended for us to have a permanent political class. That's why I don't think there were term limits in the Constitution in the first place because nobody wanted to go. I mean, everybody had their own job. They had their, you know, their land, they were whatever they were doing, their own business. And it was like, okay, James, your turn. You got to go. You got to go no, leave no, the no, ranch and it. go to work. You know. I mean, I think that that was why it was never an issue. And, and what what we need and what I think is lacking is you have to have people that have have been successful in their own area of business, develop their own expertise, and then bring that to the to the Senate or to the con, you know to mm -hmm. the House because that's the only way you get that diversity in there and that diversity of thought and of experience mm. and people that are is still really in touch with what's going on on the and you know people that have have had to sign a paycheck or people that have had to work hard to get where they are people that are dealing every day with what we deal with here just right here at home mm -hmm. and i think with the more and more isolated you get and the more and more beholden you get to special mm -hmm. interest groups, mm -hmm. the less you, you remember what you were sent there for, and you forget the people that sent you there and what it is that they need. You know, I want you to respond to, I, I noticed there was, a, there, was, there was a commercial little piece on you. Mm -hmm. I saw I saw in the two. I want to share this with my viewing audience, okay? okay. I All think right. we can play that right now. Let's play that, and I'd like for you to remark on that, okay? okay? I was 21 weeks pregnant. I had an ultrasound. My OB doctor called me and said, there's something wrong with your baby's spine and that we needed to look at terminating the pregnancy. The world stopped. Dr. Webby was the first person that gave us hope. She was the first person that said, congratulations, you're having a daughter. Dr. Webby was gonna open her back and reconstruct my daughter's entire lower spine. She just hugged me and kissed my forehead and she said, it's gonna be okay, sweetheart. I've got her and I'm gonna see you in a couple hours. I gave her the most precious thing I had. I trusted her. We have a 12 year old today because of Dr. Webby. Dr. Webby would make an incredible senator. She will always do the right thing. She will act with integrity. All of Washington needs to be full of people like Dr. Webby. I'm Dr. Monica Webby and I approve this message. I was 21 weeks pregnant. I had an ultrasound. That's my what it's like to get <laughs> Hold it. Bring it down the sound. Bring it up the mic. Just a minute. Okay. I take it we're back. Okay, three yeah, you're, we are we are back. We are back. Well, you know, I, I want to make the point too in regards to that piece. If you notice, the Oregonian did select the right photo. They really selected the right <laughs> photo. In fact, here's a here's a photo, in all due respect, of a person really seriously looking at problems. I mean, seriously looking at what she was doing on that particular piece. And, you know, and, and I guess she's going to be, as far as I'm concerned, she's going to be looking at Oregon that way. This is the way she's going to be looking at Oregon. It is a problem. We're having some major mm -hmm. problems in this, mm -hmm. in this state. And, uh, and it's not just Republicans or Democrats or Independents or Liberia. We've got mm -hmm. problems. And I think a big, a big problem, Bruce, is that people have lost confidence in our government. Yes. They don't feel like they can trust them anymore. And they feel like they're not being told the truth. And just like with our patients, just like with Lexi and that ad, if you're, if you're not honest with somebody and telling them what the real problems are, mm -hmm. then, then you can't solve the problems. You know, if you don't, don't share with American people the issues that we've got to deal with and be straightforward. I mean, we can take it. Mm -hmm. You know, we can understand that we've got to change things and get things turned around. Otherwise, we just keep, you know, putting the Band-Aid on somebody with a stab wound instead of fixing yeah. the problem. You know, they're still bleeding to death on the inside and we're just covering up the symptom. Mm -hmm. We can't do that. We have got to get down to what these big issues are. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to ask you about this piece. Of it. Mm -hmm. I remember when, when he was elected, when he was elected senator, I mm -hmm. called him up. In fact, I even had his personal personal number, mm -hmm. and he didn't respond to me. Mm -hmm. I basically, what I wanted them to do, to come on the show and basically educate the viewing audience, you know, give mm -hmm. us some enthusiasm. We're having some tough times over here. 
And that's why right. it's so refreshing that, you know, when I called you, you responded and you say, Bruce, Absolutely. I'm here. It right. wasn't about waiting till the general aspect though. You came <laughs> right on in here and said, Bruce, I'm ready to start talking about this issue now. Because the reason why I'm saying this is that you got a professional politician here. Right. He's got he's got all sorts of benefit. The benefit of sitting in office, right? He can send out flyers all over the place at your out of your pocket, our pocket. We're we're spending for this stuff. How do you deal with a guy like that, the, the professional politician? Well, I think that that's the issue, you know, is you got to let get out there and let people know who you are because it doesn't matter how great of a candidate mm -hmm. you are if nobody knows who you are. So that's why we're making a big effort to get out and talk to people and find some of the influential people in the community like you who people know and respect mm -hmm. because uh, that way people will take your word as well that uh, – that we mean business, that we, we want to get things better for our state. I mean, don't you agree, James? Yeah. Yeah. You know, in fact, I'm gonna bring another issue that's a, that's a major concern of our, it's, mm -hmm. it's a major concern of Oregon, but it happened here within this area. And I'm talking about the Columbia River Bridge, you know, that debacle. Right. So I'm gonna let James <laughs> talk a little bit about that because it was in the Oregonian not too long ago, right. couple, about that's a few right. days ago, about the 200 million bucks, and they identified the folks who basically got most of the monies, and one of which was uh, uh, from one of one of the staffers from Earl Blumenauer's person. Did you do any? Can you share us with us a little bit more? I'm mean, this might be redundant, but share it with us. We'll she'll she'll join us. Well, it's a case study in how sort of we have these elites running things, and everything that could be a public benefit is turned into a project to enrich themselves. And so, you know, you start out with something that's sort of just fundamentally idiotic from a planning perspective, which is you have these giant traffic tie-ups going both directions, and the answer is, well, let's put in a bridge with the same number of lanes, you know? So right off the bat, you know that something is completely screwy with this. And what it turns out is it's just a device to essentially have this project to, so a bunch of people can loot the state, and they can borrow a bunch of money on your credit card, and then force you to pay it off over the next 20, 30 years with tolls. And they all enrich themselves, and it's the way all of our big projects are growing. And we have an infrastructure crisis in this country, but we don't have an infrastructure crisis because we're not spending enough money. We have an infrastructure crisis because we're spending five times as much to build the same thing as it used to cost because we've got so many layers and layers and layers of consultants and, and managers and over and over again. And they. And, you know, isn't it amazing? 300 million, or whatever, however much they spend, 100, 140, 200 million, and what is there to show for it? Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. A bunch of file drawers full of paper. Well, let me ask you a question. If you were sitting in that seat and Mark Kraft was your chief of staff or working in your office and would opt to leave and then turn around and, and, uh, and become a consultant for the same project that you were working, working on and providing some of the federal monies, what would you have done? I think I'd say I'd dis I was disappointed, and we need some tougher ethics laws. <laughs> well, what would you have done to that staffer? Would you put him in jail? Well, you said, you, he him? you said he no, left. You said he left. I can't I'm, fire no, no. him, Did and I'm not the, a prosecutor, could you have so the I can't money prosecute back? him. Could you have gotten the money back? Whose money back? Our money. No, no, because money. because we have ethics laws in Oregon that ethics are almost law. completely toothless. I got ethics laws myself. It's my money. <laughs> Yeah, but, but, you know, we have a system now where we have a requirement that someone write some report, you know, that's 500 pages long about the paint chips that are going to fall in the river, whatever it is. And we know what the paint chips are. You know, we've replaced bridges 15 times. But there's a requirement to do it. So, oh, it's perfectly legal to go pay someone to buy the same report that's been written five times before. It's not illegal at all because the laws themselves are failing to control this kind of thing. Okay. Well, I, I wanted to have that little discussion just to show you <laughs> about the kind of problems we're having within right. the government situation aspect of it. Because he, he was out actually, I saw him at several of the meetings. He was out <laughs> at several of the meetings, you know, talking about this whole issue of the bridge and this, et cetera. And, you know, the average public person, he's there, he's got access. Right. Yeah. So when the money starts coming down, he's got access. Right. Someone had to sign off for those dollars, i.e. the sitting the uh, Congress. congressperson Congress at the, at the time. And so that's a concern. And so Monica, you, mm -hmm. you understand where I'm coming from? Yeah, I do. So yeah. Some, we're upset behind this whole piece. What do mm -hmm. you think about that? Would it be something you'd be looking at in I terms of... I just tell you, we've got to really be careful about the way we're spending our money yeah. nowadays. Yeah. And we've got to be certain that they're not on, 
you know, uh, just wasted. Mm -hmm. And we've got to look at what it is that we're actually trying to accomplish. I mean, if we're trying to fix, you know, uh, the the congestion going across the the river, why is it that we're putting six lanes, going from <laughs> six lanes to six lanes? I mean, it, it just doesn't make sense. And uh, so I, we've really got to look at these issues and do what's what's right and what's practical and not overspend and and then be careful that uh, that things are done in a way that are going to benefit the, the you know, Oregon and Washington, not just the people that are involved in building the bridge. You know, another area that's really that's a major problem in this area is the education arena. Yeah. We got the highest failure rate here in this particular area, like Portland Public Schools. Yeah. And it's the largest school district in the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. We got the largest, I mean, and they get the most monies, mm -hmm. if you will. And we're still constantly saying, oh, well, those minorities, this, 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 that, and the other. And we're not getting any results. You know, a lot of these young people, you know, they, they, they're going into the criminal justice system. Right. And it's costing us 60, 60, 60 40, $50,000 a year. That's that's two wages. Mm -hmm. It's you know the greatest I mean? civil rights issue of our time yes. is the fa is these corrupt and incompetent government schools right. that are right. just killing entire so, generations. So what do we do, Jane? What, what's your you break what's them yours? up. Okay. How do you, you break, break them up? up? Break them up how? You break these smaller, smaller systems. We know that the higher we go in centralizing everything the less well it works. Okay. And, 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 and we now have, you know, when I went to school, you'd be in there and you'd, you'd look at your, the, the flow chart for the whole school and it's a principal and it's an assistant principal and then it's a bunch of teachers, okay? And now there's twice as many people. There's this specialist and that specialist and all these specialists are supposed to make things better but somehow they're worse. They're just like the people who are building these bridges, okay? It's about building an education bureaucracy and not building our children's character and their knowledge. And the more you hack away at the superstructure and return the resources back down to the bottom, to the teachers and the students, the more good you can accomplish. How would you do that? How would I do that? I would say, first off, if you're federal office, I don't think it's a federal responsibility. And, and part of the problem is, you know, you have this thing where people look to the government. Well, you're from the government. Help me, okay? But we had a structure in this country that said, wait a minute. Having three levels of government charge of the same thing is just as dumb as building a bridge with six lanes to fix a traffic problem when we got six lanes, okay? Because when you have three levels of government charge of the same thing, they spend all their time fighting with each other and writing reports and going to conferences in Hawaii and on and on and on. You know, that's a mistake. You have to look at this and you have to tell people, hey, it was just dumb to get the federal government involved in education. It, everything they have done has been a step backwards. You have to take control of this on the state and local level if you want okay. to solve this okay. problem. So you're going to be there, you're going to be there, but you're going to be signing, you're not going to be signing off anything, that employment piece, are you? <laughs> you represent the federal government. You're not going to sign, you have to sign it off. Not my, I, you're not I, the employee, you're no, the employer. I told you, I, I want to go up there with pruning shears and, and that branch about common core and, and, and federal education standards and no left behind, no child left behind. Prune all that stuff out. We don't need that. That that mm -hmm. was a step backwards. Okay, fine. We got him on the chair. What do you think? What do you think? James is right. Okay, that. I think you know the key really is local control. Of, 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 of you know, it's like James is saying the the further you get up and the further the bureaucracy is and the further away they are from the from the student, the the less effective they are. I mean, we all know. I mean, I've got four kids. I don't know how many of you have. Yeah, Fourteen grandkids. Fourteen I'm grandkids, and you and you know. How many do you have? Two. Two, two. So we know we all know that each child is different. Each right. child learns differently, and in different environments, work better for different children. We need the parental involvement there. We need to be sure that uh, uh, that our teachers locally have that control to to uh, tailor education to the students. Mm -hmm. And when we're having a, a top-down approach, that just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, and then one area in education, being in this particular area, we don't have voc ed here in the Portland Public Schools. They took it out. Yeah. They took it out. Well, that Benson High School that, or, that, that has the... But that's uh, just one. one. I mean, that is an excellent place. I went to visit that, right. uh, the vocational training right. there. I, we really should do more of that mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. um, in this state because, you know, the kids can come out of there, there or out of a vocational training yeah, program and make a make a lot more money than they can coming very, out of college a lot of times. Very, very you know, so. there are so many jobs uh, that uh, aren't being filled because we don't have people that are trained to do it. Gosh, I mean, look at all the welders, plumbers, electricians. Exactly. There's a big demand for these mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. and uh, and there are, you know, nobody's trained to do it. They might go off and get a, a degree, a four-year degree, and then come out and 
still not have a you know the skills uh, that we need and you know they come out and make a hundred thousand dollars or so with sure. some of these jobs mm -hmm. so i really think that that is a disservice that you know to not offer like you're saying the vocational education right, right. tell me this why don't you share with us also to uh, maybe some of the other issues that are facing Oregonians you, you've been traveling all over the state one, one point well i out. tell you you know the one one thing that that i've been doing is i've been going around the state is talking to our businesses mm -hmm. and uh, business small business owners and people that work at those businesses trying to find out what exactly the problems are that are stifling our economy you know and and i I swear every time I ask them, the, I say, what is the, the main reason that you're having trouble growing your business? And the first thing they always tell me is uncertainty. Hmm. They say that there's uncertainty. We don't know what the regulations are going to be. We don't know what the taxes are going to be. We don't know what the, the new health care requirements are going to be. All of these mandates coming down, regulations, taxes changing, you know, 20 new taxes in the health care law, new or increasing taxes in the health care law. A lot of people have told me they've had to to um, to pull back on on what they're doing because of the cost of the new uh, premiums. You know, health insurance premiums are going up. It's um, really what's making it it difficult for people because you know we're expecting people to um, put themselves at risk both personally and financially, and they don't even know what you know what the playing field's going to be like. It's ever changing, and that's a huge issue that that I hear about. Um, the, I mean, what's the main? Is that what you hear about mostly too with your business? Regulations and uncertainty. Right. My, my business is the legal business. So mm -hmm. my business, you know, gets fat off of all of this stuff. Problem. But it's wrong. It's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody would have to call me up all the time just to dot every I right. and cross right. every right. T right. in 15 mm -hmm. different kinds of paperwork. And it's right. stupid. Yeah, and I'm, I'm feeling the same thing, you know, going mm -hmm. around talking to people here in the county. Right. Small business, you know, we want to hire. Exactly. But in all due respect, how do you do it? Right. You know what I mean? You can't do it. Right. You know another area it, that's is, sort of like another issue right now, and I'm sure it's around the state, mm -hmm. is the confusion about the Affordable Care Act. Exactly. I mean, yeah. you want to talk a little bit about that? I mean, in fact, well, you have a lot of people who have signed on. I mean, would you explain to us exactly what is the difference? We've got two different <laughs> entities here. I don't know what's going on. Good luck. These people, these people want to know what are they going to do? Uh, are they still going to be covered? Uh, what? Who's going to call them up and say, "By the way, are you going to come back? You going to come back and sign some new paperwork?" Well, you know, I, I don't think they know. I mean, I was, you know, of course, you know, I'm not privy to all the stuff that's going on at right. the state level, but uh, you know, my understanding is is they they're really not sure how that's going to work out. You know, since they had some people already signed up in the state right. exchange, now they're going to be switching to the federal. Are they going to, you know? I don't know how they're going to sort it all out, but it is a bit of a mess, and it's a, it's really a shame. I mean, what was that? It's almost depending on who you who you hear somewhere between two hundred and three hundred million dollars that were just wasted on this, you know, because of poor oversight and what was what was happening. But but you know, that's just the 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 exchange. The the technical issues are just the beginning of the problem. The problem is really with the law itself, mm -hmm. and um, you know, the mandated. Uh, uh, insurance plans. I think that, uh, you know, people were told they could keep their doctor, keep their plan, the premiums were going to go down. I was at the Farm Bureau talking with uh, these guys, and one man said, yeah, yeah, they were they were totally right about that $2,500 change in premiums. That's exactly how much mine went up, you know? <laughs> and then they had people all talking about this, and then, uh, and then you know, they, and then they knew, they knew, Bruce, that we were, that, that, that people were going to get thrown off their plans. They knew that years ago mm -hmm. three and a half years ago they they were told that that if you mandate what these plans are the people are going to be thrown off their mm -hmm. plans what we had a hundred fifty thousand oregonians that were thrown off their plans and had to buy new ones or or go you know because they didn't fit these minimum requirements like telling you that you have to pay for maternity care or or uh, pediatric orthodontia or whatever you know all of these bells and whistles that people did not necessarily want. They wouldn't let you just keep that catastrophic plan or, or a minimal plan that you want. You know, I, th I think about it like uh, car insurance. You know, people want to buy car insurance that 
that covers them if they're in a big accident. Right, right. Not car insurance that covers their oil changes and their tire changes and their gas, you mm-hmm. know, which is basically what these plans are. Mm-hmm. Their benefit package mm-hmm. is not really insurance. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't want to be spending that kind mm-hmm. of money every month. You know, along that same line, I'm thinking about now, naturally, uh, you know, once elected, we, we've got two senators in this uh, in this mm-hmm. state, uh, in Ron White, and he sees right. ways and means. That's a very important right. piece, you know That's what I'm saying? Right. And uh, I noticed that when they, when they came up with this Affordable Care Act, he was a little lukewarm in terms of supporting it. I mean, there was a little difference, if you will, between he mm-hmm. and President Obama at mm-hmm. that point in time. And in fact, I didn't see an all out push even from Earl. I don't know where he's at. Well, he's in the marijuana thing right now. So James will handle that. Piece of that kind of but, uh, you know, let's say you're elected. You, you, you have, you'd have any problems working with uh, Ron White? Oh, absolutely not. You know, Ron and I uh, have known each other, gosh, at least 10 years. And uh, um, back when I was president of the Oregon Medical Association, he was trying to get his Healthy Americans Act through. And so uh, he came to us to look at some of the medical components of that bill. And, uh, you know, not the not the the way that the that it was the legislation was going but the medical components and and uh, so he's always been one to reach out uh, to to other people that that are supposed to know what they're talking about and get their input uh, which is key is talking to people that are supposed to be experts in the different areas and and he had put together a bipartisan plan 12 republicans 12 democrats and was trying to, of course, it never even got to the floor, yeah. never even moved forward. But um, I, I have a lot of respect for Ron. I think he does try to, to come up with solutions that are acceptable to both sides and works hard at that. You know, I got to add to that, too, because uh, I remember working with him when he was a congressperson and he was very compassionate uh, about uh, seniors. Right. And he basically created the, the Great Panthers here That's in the right. state. And I was there with him, you know, in many ways. But he's very busy now. And so I'm going to be his man here on the ground. You think he could work with me? I, well, I just uh, don't <laughs> see why. I don't see why anybody couldn't work with you, Bruce. Yeah, all right, I, all right, I don't all right. see why. But like I say, Ron, I, I really have a lot of respect for him, and uh, he's 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 a, he's a very compassionate kind of a guy. Mm-hmm. He's going to do everything we can. But again, we're fortunate to have him mm-hmm. as the uh, the chair of the Ways mm-hmm. Means. I mean, mm-hmm. we do understand what that's all about. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Good. Exactly. Is there any lasting remarks you might want to say? I just uh, hope that. Uh, People realize that I'm somebody that will listen and that cares about what the issues are and very committed to trying to make a difference here. I I uh, have a job that I do right now that that I love very much, but I feel really compelled to get out and try to make a difference because I see the direction things are going. I have uh, uh, my uh, four teenagers, three boys and a girl, and uh, I'm worried about the opportunities, worried about the direction of the country. And I would uh, can summarize best why I'm doing this when I think about a, a patient that I had years ago, a, a teenager. We took his brain tumor out and he came back and gave me a thank you note afterwards. And it said, if we're if we're not here to make life better for one another, then what's the point? And I really believe that that's what we are supposed to be doing here is trying to make things better for one another. I know you believe it. I know James believes it. Yeah. You know, it's hard to put yourself out there and know what all's going to happen. Uh, we know when you do it, people think a lot of people don't want to do this job. I don't know about you, James, but a lot of people uh, that have skills and talents that would be uh, great and could really push things forward or, or don't want to run for office because right. of of what happens and you know the things people say and do to to try to you know tear you down but Mm -hmm. i think good people have to get out there and try and it's an honor to be here with Mm -hmm. the two of you Mm -hmm. because you're out there trying to make a difference Mm -hmm. and because you care well you know you know it's very refreshing and like you said it uh, i know you have a passion for what the kind of work that you're doing if you will and naturally there's there's another proponent out there that's saying well gee whiz we want to just keep her right where she's at Mm-hmm. But I also know that you are committed to in the educational system to try to produce as, to produce more surgeons, right. if you will, right. in that particular field. That's right. But uh, we, we, we're really lacking for leadership, and it's going to be refreshing to have someone like you speaking for Oregon for a minute. Because in all due respect, that's the other side of it. 
it is the, it is going to be the year of the woman, I guess. Uh, Hillary <laughs> might be, be running as a Democrat <laughs> chair. And, well, we'll see. And, and we've got our own. We'll see. There you <laughs> go. Make sure you're there. We want to make sure you're there. And well, maybe, I certainly hope she, so. I'm keeping listen. my fingers she'll listen, crossed. She'll listen to you. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make sure kids. she does. I know she will. <laughs> did you want to make, I'm sorry, did you want to make a lasting comment? No, no, I, I think I think everything. Dr. Some of our comments? Right. What do you think about some of our comments? She's, she's right on. I mean, you know, I'm I'm a little more fearful and negative than she is. I think <laughs> I think that we've got criminal gangs in D.C. that have seized control of the train and they're driving it over the cliff, you know. And so, that's what we're fighting for. We're fighting for, you know, to stop a country from going bankrupt in many ways. Well, I think I think it's very important, you know, that um, you know that we continue to talk, and I'm sure you want to encourage the folks out there to go out and vote. You oh, know, absolutely. Look at the material that you absolutely. get. Look at your voters' pamphlets and this and the other, and, and pay attention. It's yeah. very, very important, you know, because you, you need to see the people. That's why I'm so glad that you mm -hmm. came here. Oh, I'm delighted. You know I, mean? I hope you have us back again. Oh, we definitely will. I mean, I'm not uh, un unlike the other uh, other person who's running, uh, Mr. <laughs> Merkley. Uh, <laughs> You still, hey, I'm no problem. You can come on the show, and you can come, and I'll interview you and give you the same opportunity to articulate, i.e., why should Oregonians vote for you, okay? But it's very important, really, it is. I mean, I, I respect him to a certain degree, but I don't want him to be a politician. I want him to be a person that's going to react, if you will, to some of the concerns, like we talked that's about right. some of the concerns. Right. we got a very serious issue right here in, the, in this particular part of Oregon. And you're the only one that's responded to that. Yeah. And we're going to need that flow, if you will. And that's why James is here. He's responding. I can't get Earl to come up here and talk with him. But I know <laughs> James talks to him. I don't know why he doesn't. I, I'm not a recruiter, Marine recruiting. Well, I would have. <laughs> I'm not. Maybe, Earl, maybe Earl, I'm you're not intimidating, you. Bruce. Is that what it is? I, 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 I am intimidating. No, I am. And it's for fact, I am. You know what I mean? Uh, and we're looking for good leadership. Seriously. All right, we, we, we're, need, we're, we're a beautiful state. You know what I mean? We're not, in all due respect, we're not uh, back east. Uh, we're not L.A. Right. We're here in Oregon. We've got a beautiful country. We've got a beautiful setting, if you will. And uh, we don't have some of the major problems. We can mm -hmm. solve our problems. And so we're working together. And so that's mm -hmm. what we need folks like yourself, if you will, and James, if you will, and mm -hmm. Mike, to, um, to take our lead. You know what I mean? Because you're going to be representing government. Right, <laughs> the face you, of government. And you're going to be pruning, if you will. <laughs> I mean, probably, probably gets that from the wine country. Uh, yes, He's in the wine know. country. He's been out there in the fields. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to laugh. You want to say anything to the kids? What do you say oh, to the kids out there? Hey, everybody. We love you. <laughs> mama's, mama's working. We're working hard, door. trying so to save going? the world for you. I got you. We're going to be going now. What are you going to be doing? What other, other things are you going to be doing in, in, around, around Oregon? Oh, gosh, we, we are everywhere all the time. We have been, uh, gosh, as far uh, south down, down to Klamath Falls, Medford. We've gone all the way out to the coast. We've been all the way out to Ontario, Baker City. Uh, everywhere, yeah. getting out and meeting people, and yeah. and it is it's really a, an education to yes. get out there, get out to our our uh, timber counties, uh, down to our uh, all of our onion farms, yeah. Yeah. our uh, you know different areas. Getting outside of the Portland area, it's just a it's just totally yeah. um, totally different set of concerns. And yeah. if you yeah. don't get out there and talk yeah. to those people, you yes. don't really realize yes. what they yeah. are. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, again, from Ron's passion, that he's given me the baton. Maybe the next time you're in town, we'll pick a camera crew and we'll visit some of the senior citizen centers. Oh, I'd love and that. Maybe have lunch with them. In fact, I get James to come on there with us. We'll just go out and <laughs> knock on some of the doors and listen to some of the things that they're having. Is That'd that be wonderful. Okay, fine. Thank you very well, much. Thank for you being so much for really having us. I appreciate that. Monica, you're going to be great. Thank James is going to be thank great. You. Folks, thank you very much. We'll be back with our next guest. Take care. Vote. Get out and vote. Get out and vote. Take care. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
go. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Fred Stewart, and we did a little little shake around here on the Bruce on the Oregon Voters Digest show with Bruce Bassard. As you well know, Bruce Bassard is running for office, and after a lot of pushing, I got him to allow me to interview him uh, officially as a candidate for Multnomah County Commissioner District Two. Also on here today, we've got Sharon Maxwell, who's running against Nick Fish, who's also running for him. City, city Council, council number city, two. Yes. That's a very important position to black folks. Number two, both in county and the city. Bruce, welcome to your show. Well, thank you very much. Sharon, welcome to Oregon Voters Digest. Thank you so very much for having me here today. We're going to be working together, and I think you need to spend more time with, with Sharon, okay? Well, I'm going to ask questions to both of you. No, guys. but I want her to spend some time. You We're going to get make sure people get to know Sharon. I, I, do that first, okay. please. Let's start off since awesome. people know about you. We are going to start with Sharon. Thank you very much, Fred. Sharon. Tell us about yourself. Sure. So I'm a native Oregonian, third year, third generation Oregonian, yeah. born and raised here. I'm a, I'm a business owner. I'm a mother, I'm a community builder and a community activist. And I've been running my own construction company for the last 14 years here in Portland, Oregon. Wow. What high school did you go to? Went to James Madison High School and also Portland Community College, graduated with my associate's degree, mm -hmm. and I'm currently finishing up my bachelor's in business administration. Class of what year? Of which? High school. High school, 1982. Wow. Yes, red and blue. Senators, go. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Had a lot of friends in that year. Yes. <laughs> Bruce, what class of high school were you in? Well, let's see, class of 83. No. <laughs> <laughs> gonna, you ain't going to get me in that he, arena. He's trying to do one of my numbers because yeah. my, my oldest daughter, she's turning 29, and so I'm always a year older than she is. So, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's a good deal. That's a good deal. Well, you got a, that's a woman. Wow. Yes. You're that old? You don't look that old. I'm very young, just um, 30. Wow. Turning 30 this year. Well, you know, in all due respect, I mean, we're going to be working together. You know, she's, yeah. she's, she's representing the city of Portland. I'm going to be representing the county. But again, too, this is another way of us kind of getting together and kind of understanding and letting the people know just why they, they should be voting for us right mm -hmm. off the bat. Exactly. And, and respect, Sharon, yeah. why, why are you running? What, what made you decide to get into the race? Because I couldn't sit back another moment, another five years, another 20 years and sit back and watch our leaders not have a strategic plan or work with citizens that lived in the neighborhood where I live. That's Northeast Portland. Um, over the last 21 years, there's been devastation and destruction, young people's lives being destroyed, families' lives not having uh, economic opportunity and stability, seeing the displacement and the gentrification, and just recognizing that it's going to take real leadership that has courage, who can come up with a strategic plan, but also uh, making sure that citizens have voice at City Hall. It's, it's time for a shared community value at City Hall that reflects people from all 95 neighborhoods who will have a voice, who will actually have the opportunity to step up their participation by having town, more town halls for City Hall so that we can get citizens input, recognizing their voice, their ideas, and how they want their city to look over these next 20 to 30 years. Wow. What in your background leads you to believe that you can do all that? Well, first of all, as a general contractor, a female in a non-traditional role. In 1993, when I recognized that the community was blighted and devastated, I said that we're going to have to step up our game, that we're better than this as citizens who live in Northeast Portland. We have to take pride. And I went up to Portland Community College and found out about the Construction Trades Program. I'm pretty adventurous, and so they had the carpentry program. I said, I think this is what I want to do, because what I wanted to be able to do was my part. How do we rebuild our community to make sure that people have jobs, but also that we take pride in the community where we live? And um, went through the construction trades program, my first apprenticeship. Um, the carpenters wouldn't let me in, mm. but I did complete my certificate there at the Portland Community College, but I became a sprinkler fitter. Mm. And my first project was the Rose Quarter. So I reamed all that pipe 
and hunk it with my journeymen and also a lot of those fireheads that are through the concourse and the suites. And I recognized on that job there that yes, it was construction because I seen the different trades and I seen the opportunity for people in the community that they could get the skills as well to have living wage jobs and benefits to be able to take care of their community, to be able to be able to contribute and have an opportunity to have a great life and success right here in Portland. And as a general contractor, I've been able to hire over 200 people in the local community through my company and through my nonprofit that I started, Y2ABC, Youth and Young Adult Being Connected. When I seen just young people being disconnected in the community, young men specifically, I was very concerned as a mother and as a business owner why were our young people self-destructing? And so I started this program when one of my son's friends committed suicide. Mm. He just said he couldn't take it anymore. And I wrote a book, The Investment Portfolio, and the book is based on how I raised my own children. Um, and with this investment portfolio combined with my youth program, it helps young people to connect their education to their career futures, been able to bring in speakers from all the different trades, collaborate and collectively work with other nonprofits and organizations right here in the community. So my track record of recognizing that there's a problem coming up with real solutions working with people from all over the city, uh, civil engineers, uh, scientists, environmental scientists. I was on the board of uh, Groundwork Portland, uh, which is an environmental justice and social economic um, national program. Uh, my program also, I created the first green team for young people, uh, Van Jones, that they were reaching out to the African-American community and communities of color mm -hmm. to make sure that as this new green economy and the new energy cost savings projects that people of color as well could be able to get their opportunity and make sure that they have, have a, a, a good standard of life. And so in um, recognizing throughout the years, um, I worked um, as the president for Peninsula Little League um, during the late 90s into early 2000. The league was a small league at the time. It had deteriorated. I was able to come in with citizens from the neighborhood. We turned that league around where we had maybe 10 teams. We went from 10 teams from t-ball all the way up to junior baseball and softball had over 600 families and mm. 1200 children mm. and our kids were uh, winning state and regional championships and what that did was it helped to build community yeah. a sense of success helping our young people to be connected to positive healthy choices in the community and as a business owner i recognize is that People want to be able to contribute in their local community. And that's the same passion, the same energy that I feel that I'm going to bring to City Hall as a commissioner to help connect citizens from throughout the 95 neighborhoods to make sure that, first of all, they have prosperity and economic success, that we can hold the county accountable for the services that it says it will do for human services and our school systems. I've seen Portland Public Schools was the cream of the crop when we were going to school. How do we go from 77,000 students down 44,000, from 14 good viable high schools down to only eight, in which three are population are 500 to 750? We do not at this time have world-class high schools and schools throughout our local communities. And I feel that it's time for self-correction in the city of Portland, and it has to come from strong leadership. That's what I have, is strong leadership as a business owner, as a female in a non-traditional trade. I've been working with all predominantly older white men and recognizing, wait a minute, we all have to have a shared community value. So we pay less taxes and fees when people have jobs and they can take care of themselves and their families, we don't have to rely on so many social services and nonprofits when people are invested in. People matter when we need to make sure that all people have the ability to take care of themselves in the city. You know, Fred, in all due respect, that's one of the reasons why I, it's so refreshing to hear, hear someone 
uh, as, as an old black man, <laughs> uh, you know, listen to what uh, she was. That's why I was impressed with uh, with some of the comments that she'd made. For instance, like creating jobs. You know, I mean, we have a similar background in terms of construction. I was a general contractor also too, and I know the ups and downs. And to be able to work with someone like that, being i.e. a county commissioner, I'm going to have to work very closely with the city. It's the it's the largest proponent within the within the county if you will that, that line so it's a very important piece and it's very important to have the right leadership because you have to communicate as an example when you think about the whole issue of the Trader Joe's situation yes you know my the process I would have taken I'm sure she'll probably have some comments along that line is that we would have been working together yes. the moment the mayor brought up the idea that Trader Joe's is going to be coming to town we would have been at the table yes. he would have contacted her because mm -hmm. she because it's in her area more so yes. it's not districtized yes. but they, he would have responded to that she then might have called me up and then right. we would have sat down and talked about the whole piece and then we'd look at the project as, as a whole if you will and start looking at who's going to build it yes how many jobs are going to have after the fact sure, uh, sure. how many how, because the jobs are already specked out we already right. know that yes. the, we, they already know exactly how many people mm -hmm. are going to be important and what in the various trades and whatever we right. would have contacted the various craft if they were if they were uh, if they were if they were union mm -hmm. we contact the union folks agcs right. and others yes. if they were non union we would contact so and so and whatever but the bottom line is that that's what you have to work with and i'm saying it's so refreshing to be able to say i can work with her because she knows exactly where i'm coming from and then that's a very, very important piece. We wouldn't have had this issue with reference to Trader Joe's had we met because then it would have been just a shoveling thing. Right. Because then right. we would have been out there, everybody would have been out there, the TV would have been out there, we'd be breaking grounds, the people would have been happy, mm -hmm. uh, folks would know they'd been working before they got built and after it got built. Right. Yeah? No. Well, that's part of my platform is stepping up Good. community participation Good. to the next level. We want to invite our citizens in the process up front. We don't want to wait to after the fact. We want to acknowledge them up front because historically in Portland, in North Northeast Portland, the city has done a lot of planning and processing without the citizens who mm -hmm. live in that neighborhood. Who you and want to represent, who you will, who you will be representing. I'm representing the That's people right. and, it's, right. and it's about That's single right. member districts. That's my That's platform right. yes. because we need to have city commissioners elected per districts so that there's a better accountability, transparency, and oversight as it reflects to planning and budgeting so that when the county's budgets are being put together, when the Portland Public Schools, we have a better oversight of recognizing planning for the next 20 to 30 years, mm -hmm. what our city should look like, citizens having input to say, yes, this is what I want my neighborhood to look like, and to make sure that the monies are being prioritized based on infrastructure needs, mm -hmm. not just good projects, but infrastructure because we have a hundred year old pipe that really needs and yeah, should be right. replaced right now. Mm -hmm. And so with having single member <clears throat> district, it would allow the city commissioner to be more connected with the district, exactly. with the people who live there and know what the true needs are. Now Sharon, you know, I was president of King Neighborhood for 10 years. Yes, I remember that, Fred. And I was very active in Northeast Portland for 10 years. And I remember this, Fred. And you know, my grandfather was very, very active in Portland too. And I remember that as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now, what would you do if the city had an inclusion process in which, I don't know, 10, 12,000 neighbors decided to get involved with, and the others didn't, would you consider that inclusive or not? Even though it's considered nationwide a very successful effort. Well, what I really believe is that our Office of Neighborhood Involvement, which gives us our seven district coalitions and our neighborhood associations, are a very good program, but we're not utilizing them to the best capacity. First of all, we need to build relationship with the people who live in those neighborhoods. When you're putting up fences that enclose you in from your neighbors, when I see my neighbors, I want to be able to say, Hello, Fred. Good morning. Hello, neighbor. How are you? I don't want to see fences going up that separate us. So we need to do a better job in the city of Portland of recognizing each other's humanity. I think that's part of why and where we failed in the city of Portland. We have a good structure already in place, but we're not using it to its fullest capacity. And that's what I found out as I have met with a lot of the city's bureaus. We have, we're paying tens of millions of dollars for maintenance fees for software that we're not even using because we're coming into the- Shannon got in after you. This is why I get so mad at the Oregonian. Did you see 
in the Oregonian Friends, the endorsement between Nick Fish and Sharon here. Mm-hmm. Nick Fish, not hating on him. I like having beers with him. I never had a beer with Nick. I would. But I've never in my entire time of knowing Nick have, have heard Nick talk like this about basically public involvement. She's saying it the long form because I'm like Nick. She, she's not talking in wonkies where wonks can understand. She's talking about na- na- uh, neighborhood involvement. She's a little rough around the edges because she's not in the process yet. But she's touching on the points that everybody, I think, in the community is interested in. And our largest paper, with some very highly educated white people, decided not to <laughs> highlight that Highlight that with Sharon. It is so difficult to be a black leader in Oregon. It's just, sometimes it's better just to walk into a room like the editorial board and be rude because it doesn't make any difference you can be extremely smart you can have a lot to contribute but are the white people in the room are they going to treat you like mr silverman at the Cl- at the clippers <laughs> you know what i mean or are they going to treat us like the way you probably would treat us the bottom line is i'm sitting up here watching these two people talk and the ma- the major media all controlled by educated white folks who even maybe have had sex with a black person or two they don't they don't even talk about <laughs> this stuff <laughs> Gee, 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 I mean, that's pretty. That's pretty hard. But anyway, but I, 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 I we get you. We get your point. Yes, right. public servant. Right. Very Sharon good. Maxwell. She's talking about servant. being a public but, servant. But yeah. put in my head just and, for a and, moment. And but just put in my head on just for a, for a moment. We reference to Oregon Voters Digest. I had the opportunity to see Nick Fish yesterday. It was an elders in action. Yes. And after the, after the comments were made, and I was there also too. I. I talked to him mm-hmm. about possibly coming on the show, right. but unfortunately, he did not want to come on the show. Too many black people here. He did not want to come on the show. Too many black people important. here. But we'll still You'll never get a lost Nick opportunity. But we'll still invite him. Right? Yes, right? of course. Nick ain't coming. Coming, right? Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. There's too many black people well, here. Well, I'm asking for your vote and your yeah, support yeah, on yeah, May mm-hmm. 20th, Sharon Maxwell for your next city commissioner, a true public servant, a true community activist, a commu- true community builder who will work for you and with you to make sure that you have a great quality of life in the city of Portland. And we'll work together. And we'll work together. Yes, very Thank so. you. That's fair. All right. All right. Good. Night. Very good. Thank you. Well, I think that's it.